We're glad that you're here. We welcome you, and if you're visiting with us, we encourage you to fill out a visitor's card in front of you and put that in the collection, as it will be taken up after the second song, if you don't mind doing that, please. But you are our honored guest, and we thank you for being with us this morning. Our first hymn this morning will be number 11, A Beautiful Prayer. And following the singing of hymn, Brother Joel will direct our minds in our opening prayer. <clears throat> if you can stand for the singing and the prayer following, please stand at this time. In the Bible we read of a beautiful prayer, a prayer sent to heaven above. It was prayed by a heart that was laden with care and filled with such wonderful love. When he was praying, Jesus was praying there in Gethsemane. Send loving Father, send loving Father, if you will, let this cup pass from me. No, he was thinking, no, he was thinking, death would bring to his own. Deep was his sorrow, deep was his sorrow, when he was praying alone. You can catch the sad tone of his voice as he said, Thy will, not mine, O oh, must be done. As a lamb to the slaughter, he soon must be led to die as the crucified one. When he was praying, Jesus was praying there in Gethsemane. Send loving Father, send loving Father, if you will, let this cup pass from me. No, he was thinking, no, he was thinking, grief, death would bring to his soul. Deep was his sorrow, deep was his sorrow, when he was praying alone. As he prayed there alone in such deep agony, it was a most beautiful prayer. Just to think his great heart was all broken for me, that he, my great sorrow, must share. When he was praying, Jesus was praying there in Gethsemane, send loving Father, send loving Father, if you will, let this cup pass from me. No, he was thinking, no, he was thinking, grief, death would bring to his own. Deep was his sorrow, deep was his sorrow, when he was praying alone. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day that you've blessed us with. We want to thank you for our good health and for our desire to be here, to be with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and to be able to sing songs of praise unto you, and to lift up our prayers, and to be able to hear a, another word, another portion of your word. We ask that you'll be with Brother Josh in a few moments as he opens that word and delivers it to us. We ask that you'll be, he'll be able to recollect all the things that he is studying and be able to present them to us in a way that will be beneficial. We ask that you be with all those who could not be with us this morning, particularly those who, who are sick. We know that we have many of our number that, that aren't doing well, that are in the hospital or having tests. We just ask that you'll be with those and be with those who are caring for them, and if it be your will, just restore them to a better portion of health so they can come back and be with us once again. I'm going to ask that you be with the, the, the families that have lost loved ones in our congregation. Put your arm of comfort around them. 
I ask you to be with all those who are away this week who might be traveling and just be with them and bring them back home safely. We thank you for the many blessings that you bestow upon us from day to day. We thank you for this great country that we live in, and we ask that you'll be with our leaders. And may they always look to you for guidance. We ask that you'll be with all of our first responders and those who keep us out of harm's way and just keep them safe as well. We thank you so much for your son, our, our Lord and Savior, who you sent to this world to lead the perfect example and to die a cruel death on the cross of Calvary for the mission of our sins. And We thank you for your plan of salvation and for giving us the Bible, and we hope that we'll open it and study it and apply the things that we learn there to our lives so that we can become better Christians for you. As we go through the rest of the service, we ask that you'll be with us, and everything that we do and say here this morning will be done decently and in order, and we certainly ask that you'll forgive us of our sins. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> 283. Jesus, keep me near the cross, has been selected to help us prepare our minds, our thoughts for the taking of the Lord's Supper. Immediately following the singing of the hymn. 283. <clears throat> Jesus, keep me near the cross. There's a precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory. soul shall find rest beyond the river near the cross a trembling soul love and mercy found me there the bright and morning star sheds its beams around Does everybody have the emblems, the fruit of the vine, the cups, and all that? In a couple of weeks, starting in June, we'll be doing it the old-fashioned way, passing the trays again. So uh, we're looking forward to that, which is going to change a little bit, and that'll be all explained as time goes on. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, he continued his speech until midnight. That's why we're here. That's part, of the, that's part of God's plan to have the Lord's Supper every Lord's Day, period. And in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42, <clears throat> he says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, 
in breaking bread and fellowship and in prayers. And when we think about uh, the importance of it, that's why we'll be able to hopefully in a couple of weeks go back to the way we used to do it, give more people time to meditate and think about Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. The sacrifice he made for mankind and the shedding of his blood. I like to read Matthew chapter 26. I could probably quote it, but we're going to read it to get it word from word. Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take eat, take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new of you in my Father's kingdom. Let's give thanks. Our almighty God, we're so appreciative of what Jesus has done for mankind and uh, dying on the cross for our sins, our transgressions, of what we deserve. We, you have given us so much. Uh, by giving us opportunity now to partake of uh, the bread who represents as your people uh, the body of Christ. We pray that you, we will partake in a pleasing manner to thee and in Jesus' name, amen. think about the, the scourging that Jesus went through. I always think about that every time I take the Lord's Supper. The, the way they did it with uh, sharp objects uh, with this type of, of, of whip that would inflict such punishment. The tearing of flesh. The blood flowing from Jesus' body. Let's, let's think about that as we partake of of the uh, uh, continuation of the Lord's Supper. Likewise, as, as we are about to partake of the fruit of the vine, who represents to the Christian the blood that Jesus shed for our sins, we will pray that we would partake in a pleasing manner. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, let us give thanks for for the uh, for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here together and giving us the ability the ability to be able to to get up and to work and 
Father, we thank you for providing us with jobs. And, and Lord, we just ask that you'll watch our verse and, and uh, be with us at this time. And may we give with our hearts. This I pray and ask in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. If you will, please mark your hymn books number 696, 696. If you use no hymnal, be our song of encouragement following the lesson this morning. 696. And after that, turn your hymn books number 605 for the song before the scripture reading and the lesson this morning. 605. Walking the King's Highway. <clears throat> I'm going someday to the yonder fair land. I'll make it my home by holding his hand. All my troubles will cease when I walk through the gate. The crown to receive. Walk down the highway, the King's Highway. I'll walk on that day, my Savior will lead. He'll show me the way. All say once to me, there will love once to greet. Walk there someday down the King's Highway in Canaan's fair land, eternity more. The city of God redeemed once to join. Hallelujah to sing. Streets of pure gold down the King's Highway, the King's Highway. I'll walk on that day, my Savior will lead. He'll show me the way. All the saints once to me. There were loved ones to 
grave I'll walk there someday Down a king's highway By faith I can see My mansion up there The summons shall come From court there on high Over Jordan so wide There he safely will lead I'll pass through the gate Down the king's highway The king's highway On that day, my Savior will lead. He'll show me the way. All the saved ones to me, they're my loved ones to grieve. I'll walk there someday down the King's Highway. Scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father. Your version was shorter than our version. We probably should have had him run around the pulpit for a little bit to get it out of the system. He goes in for surgery. Is it tomorrow? So, tomorrow for knee surgery. I'm glad to be here today. I'm glad to see you all here today. You got some smiles on your face. That's always good to see. Of course, there could be something on my face is why you're smiling. I preached one time for a half hour with a piece of chicken in my beard. So I looked out at the audience and my girls were like, and I, I couldn't figure out what they're talking about. Finally, someone said, you got chicken in your beard. When I uh, uh, went to uh, grade school in the first grade, I had a habit I grew up on a farm where my parents raised a hog down at my grandmother's and we raised lots of chickens and things like that. So every morning we had eggs and bacon just about. Uh, and uh, I would put a piece of bacon in my mouth and I'd come home with that same piece of bacon in my mouth. I chewed on it all day and uh, that's something to think about, isn't it, Laura? I want to talk to you about Daniel. The title of my lesson this morning is Daniel Prayed. And so the sermon is about prayer. And really, the way I've been writing him lately, it's about two sermons in one. So if I want to bail halfway through, I can. But if we finish the whole sermon this morning, in the beginning, I want to first look at four words that are used to describe Daniel's prayers in the book of Daniel. And if we make it to the second half, I want to look at the character of Daniel's prayer. And the reason I want to look at Daniel and the way that he prayed and the character of his prayer is because I think he's a great example for us today. We need more prayer warriors in the Lord's church. Prayer is something that I am convinced is needed for the kingdom to grow. As a matter of fact, I've never known of any revival that's ever existed in the history of the church that did not begin on someone's knees. And I could give you example after example. If you begin with the beginning of the church, Jesus ascended into heaven, and for 10 days, the apostles waited for the Spirit to come down, and they had a prayer meeting for 10 days. And so Daniel 
is a great example of prayer. Now I know all of you are bluegrass music aficionados. And so you probably know that in 1959, the Stanley brothers recorded a song, a traditional song called Daniel Prayed. Uh, for you aficionados, that was the same year that they also recorded on the other side of that album, O Come Angel Band. Some of you will be familiar with that version, the Stanley Brothers version. I know Tom and I have talked about this. It's at the end of the movie, Old Brother, Where Art Thou? Where you've got that fella and he's on, what do you call that train uh, mechanism that he's on? He's making it go like this. Sidecar. And they're playing the 1959 version. Well, on the other side, uh, you used to have albums and there would be the A side and the B side. For the other side, they call it the flip side. And on the flip side, they had this song, Daniel Prayed. Have any of you ever heard it? All right. I'm not going to sing it to you, but I want to read it to you. I read of a man one day, he wasted no time away. He prayed to God every morning, noon, and night. He cared not for the things of ale, but trusted one who never fails. Oh, Daniel prayed every morning noon and night. Daniel served his living God while on the earth he trod. He prayed to God each morning, noon, and night. He cared not for the king's decree, but trusted God to set him free. Daniel prayed every morning, noon, and night. They locked him in the lion's den because he could not honor men, but he prayed to God every morning, noon, and night. The jaws were locked made him shout, and God soon brought him safely out. Daniel prayed every morning, noon and night. And then the song ends with this admonition. Now, brother, let us watch and pray like Daniel did from day to day. He prayed to God every morning, noon and night. We too can gladly dare and do and pray to God. He'll see us through. Daniel prayed every morning, noon and night. And so here you have this example of Daniel. And you notice it was numerous times across Daniel's life. And the songwriter, we don't know who the songwriter is. It's what we call a traditional song. I believe a song becomes a traditional song, or at least the copyright uh, it, it is, is taken away after 100 years. But this is hundreds of years old. The Stanley brothers, Carter and Ralph, Carter died in 1966, and Ralph just recently died. I never got to see Carter, but I uh, saw uh, Ralph play uh, quite often. As a matter of fact, my favorite band that he had after Carter was a little-known fellow by the name of Keith Whitley. You remember him? Well, he started out with Ralph Stanley. Why am I telling you about Ralph Stanley? Yes, Ralph Stanley and Carter grew up in the primitive Baptist church down in the Clinch Mountains of Virginia. You guys ever been to the Clinch Mountains? I wanted to go to the Clinch Mountains on my honeymoon to the Ralph Stanley Museum, but ironically that didn't happen. I'm not sure why. We was going to be going through Racine and stop at the Bill Monroe Museum too, but that also did not happen. They grew up in the Primitive Baptist Church, and the Primitive Baptists will tell you that they have a tradition. They call it a tradition of a cappella singing. But they were so far down there in Virginia in those mountains, during the time that they were coming up, they were accustomed to a type of singing that was called call and answer singing. And if you trace the history back to the call and answer type of singing, it really started with country uh, churches, places way out in remote areas of the country, and many of the people who went there, I've heard it said, many of them were illiterate, that, that, that's very possible. But even amongst the brethren, if you were to attend Bethany, when Alexander Campbell was preaching there, they didn't supply you with a hymn book. You all remember that. See the perks you get here? 
You had to buy your own, and you had to bring your own. And by the way, I think I've showed some of you Campbell's hymn book. There wasn't a note in it. So they didn't worry about the uh, pitch pipe at that time. But down there in the Clinch Mountains in Virginia, call and answer was going on. You didn't have a hymn book, and there was only a few hymns that they, that they knew. And so, someone might say, Amazing Grace. And then the congregation would go, Amazing Grace. Then the song leader would say, How sweet the sound. How sweet the sound. You see how it's going? And that's the tradition that they grew up in. Daniel prayed. What a powerful song. Go home and check it out on YouTube. Don't check it out now unless you have headphones. But Daniel, it doesn't surprise me that so many songs are written about Daniel, in particular, his connection to prayer. Now I want to look at these four words. I better look at the time. I can't see it back there. Let me look here. I probably used about 10 minutes on Ralph Stanley, but we're going to start here. <clears throat> In Daniel chapter 6 and verse 10, Daniel 6 and verse 10, and you could just keep your Bible open to Daniel because I'm going to be camping out there. We're going to be moving around a little bit, but mostly in the book of Daniel. In Daniel 6 and verse 10, the Bible says, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, what writing? That he couldn't pray. This is the decree that he could not worship his God, Jehovah. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house. And his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem. By the way, so all could see. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Now I am old enough to remember when men still would get on their knees and pray. I tried to encourage Jim to do that this morning, but he didn't take me up on it. It's probably not the getting down so much, Jim, and maybe the getting up that might be the problem with that old knee. Uh, but come back. We're going to auction that knee off with uh, Scott's here one of these days. There's still some use left in them. But I remember when preachers, how many of you remember when people used to bow? Did you guys have that up here in Morgan County? Uh, they were a duck wall, all right. By the way, we have visitors from the Ohio Valley. That's where I grew up, in the Ohio Valley. I'm from a little town called Bellsville, Ohio. It's known around there as a great thriving metropolis. You've probably heard of it. Uh, but I remember preachers and men in the congregation especially uh, who would bow on their knees. I think of the missionary, David Livingston, Many of you have heard of him. He's uh, more widely known in the world as the African explorer, the one who opened up what was called at that time the Dark Continent. It was called dark because people didn't know where anything was. David Livingston opened that, that, uh, uh, that part, well, many parts of Africa up. When he died, uh, you could go into his room after that and some of them opened up his home as sort of a museum. You could go in, and I've seen pictures of it, next to his bed, he had three-quarter inch tongue and groove flooring, and next to, his bread, next to his bed, there was a spot where there were two grooves in the tongue and groove flooring. They weren't grooves that came with the wood. They were grooves that were made by his knees. When he died, his servant found him on his knees. The apostles were praying people. James in the Bible, he had a nickname amongst the early church. Do you know what it was? Old Camel Knees. Why do you think they called him Old Camel Knees? He was a praying man. This word here for prayed uh, on his knees to give thanks is the Hebrew word Barak. All right? Barak means to bless and to kneel. And that's where we get that word. 
Not to be confused with Barack as a title, I'm thinking of our former president, but Barack to kneel, to bless. When I was in Israel, many of the African brethren, I think of one, I mentioned him a few weeks ago, uh, uh, Brother Godwin was his name, he was from Nigeria. When he would pray, he would say, oh, Heavenly Father, and then he would say, we bless you. We bless your name. We bless you for this. We bless you for that. Now, you don't hear that much in America. I haven't heard anybody in America when they pray say, we bless you or we bless your name. But that's very biblical. You might try it sometime when you pray. We are blessing the name. We are bowing down, kneeling down, Barak, and blessing him. Giving thanks. Helen Keller said, so much has been given to me that I've had no time to ponder that which I don't have. Think about that when you're complaining about your job and the kids and the dishes and the grass and all of these things. Look at all we've been given. Bless God for what he's blessed you. Joni Erickson Tata, if you don't know Joni Erickson Tata, she is a paraplegic. I'm sorry, she's a quadriplegic. Uh, when she was 17 years old, she was on a swim team in her high school and she jumped off the diving board and she hit her neck the wrong way and all of these years she's been a quadriplegic. But if you get a chance to get on YouTube, type in Tony Erickson Tata, if you hear her inspiring story, well, you can't help but be inspired. She said this, and maybe you've been at a point in your life when you were so down and out, when you had the blues so bad, you were struggling with how to respond to God. This is what she says about giving thanks. Giving thanks is not a matter of feeling thankful. Sometimes it's a matter of obedience. Obey me if you love, if you love me. Obey my commandments. Why does Tony... Uh, Erickson Tata, why does she understand that sometimes giving thanks is a matter of obedience? It's because God wants us to give him thanks. Because when we give him thanks, we bless his name. But the blessing is really ours. I've went through some hard times, folks. And I try now when hard times sneak up on me, which they usually do. When they do that, I try to think, what good is there in this? Because I know there is good because I love the Lord. And all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Think about the pilgrims when they came here. Westermile said the pilgrims made seven times more graves than huts when they first came to America. Nevertheless, they set aside a day of thanksgiving once a month. Ephesians 3, 14, the scripture our brother read for us says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have the knees of a camel? Have you ever seen camel knees, by the way? If you look at my elbow, I roofed for years. I was constantly scraping that elbow across those shingles. It's just kind of white. And uh, it's awful disgusting, really, to think about it. When my mother says, keep your elbows off the table, it's for uh, uh, reasons other than just simple manners. It's hard to eat. But have you ever seen a camel's knees? They're like that. They look like a stone. All of the hair has been worn off, and they're hard as a stone. I remember that about camels. I also remember camels spit, and camels stink something fierce. But those knees are that way because they spend most of their time sleeping, and they are on their knees quite a bit. Now then, he prayed and gave thanks. That's our first word, to bend, to bow down. The second word is to make petitions. This is praying and making supplication. In Daniel 6, 11, the Bible says, Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Now that's a word, kanan, which means to favor or to entreat, to show mercy. Have you ever wondered, because you've heard and read in the Bible, this idea of making supplication. 
Now, these are words that are used for prayer that are used many times interchangeably, but there is a minutia, uh, or it's in the minutia that you see the difference. This supplication is to entreat, to beg. Now, I'm here to tell you I don't have enough pride, or my pride isn't so great, I should say, that I can't admit that there's been times I've been on my knees begging God. But I do not need to be ashamed of that. I am not alone in that. Daniel spent time on his knees begging God. In Daniel 6.11, these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication. What does prayer do? One poet said it this way. What various hindrances we meet in coming to a mercy seat. Yet who that knows the worth of prayer but wishes to be often there? Prayer makes the darkened cloud withdraw. Prayer climbs the ladder that Jacob saw. It gives exercise to faith and love and brings every blessing from above. Restraining a prayer, we cease to fight. Prayer makes the Christian's armor bright and Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saints upon his knees. I'm here to tell you, the devil doesn't worry so much about what we might say or what we might do, but he trembles when we are praying. There's power in that. And finally, in Daniel 9.20, judge self. Here it says, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sins and the sins of my people in Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of God. Here he is Praying and confessing. Now, this word really excited me when I began to delve into the original Hebrew. It is from a Hebrew word, yadal. And what it means is this. Literally, to use the hand. That is, to hold it out and to use it to physically throw a stone. Oh, isn't that curious? Here it says, and while I was speaking and praying, and in the Hebrew, throwing a stone. Did you notice how the English translated it? Confessing. You remember Jesus in the book of John. What did he say? In John chapter 8 and verse 7, So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto him, he that is without sin among you, what? Let him cast the first stone. Now think about the context. Do any of you have sin? The implication of the Hebrew word yadal there would be if you have sin, let you be the first one to what? Confess it. You throw the first stone. That's what we're doing. You know, the Bible says in the book of James that when we come together, we should confess our faults one to another. And I think I've talked to some of you about this. This is not talking about when the invitation is sung, someone coming down forward and repenting of their sins publicly. That is a biblical principle, there's no doubt. And there are many places in the New Testament where I would urge you today, if you have sin in your life, to come forward, to repent of it and let the saints pray for you. But when James is speaking to these early disciples and saying, confess your faults one to another, he was speaking concerning a practice. And what happened was this. Let's say Tommy and I, we, we, we go, we meet each other uh, to have a prayer meeting. And we, we are praying for one another. And I, Tommy comes up to me and says, Josh, I'd like to confess my faults to you. I need you to pray for me on them. And he does just that. He confesses certain faults. I pray with him. Now notice, confess your faults one to another. When he's done confessing his faults, I say, now brother, it's my turn. And I confess my faults. And then he prays for them. You see, that's something that the Lord's church, for some reason, has neglected through the years. We've lost it through the centuries of going to one another and saying, hey, I need you to pray for this. And the other one by responding, you're not alone. 
I'm struggling with something too. Would you pray for me? I miss the day when brethren would come forward at the invitation song and would just simply say, I'm struggling with this. I need you to pray. And the congregation would come around and we'd all circle around and we'd pray for that one. I'll tell you, when the church works right, there's nothing like it. Numerous times I was down front. There's times I'm tempted to come down front now. Things that I struggle with. Sins. But also trials. Temptations. You know, there is a difference between sinning and being tempted. I've had friends who were tempted by alcohol. Friends of whom I'd had to go into the bar and take them out. And I'd, they'd come out and be just crying like a baby. Grown men. Because the temptation was too great. But we prayed with these folks over and over and over again. I remember there was a great temptation in my life. A struggle that I prayed over and over again. And it was a root of bitterness in my heart. And I kept just going back to thinking this negative way and feeling this way. And I'd pray every night, Lord, forgive me for thinking this way. Forgive me over and over again. Finally, finally, with prayer and supplication, I was able to beg the Lord, not necessarily to forgive me, which I know he had, but to deliver me from this temptation. I told you finally, but I lied. We have a point four on this. Offer praise. Oh, I want to go back to that uh, Yadal, this idea of confessing. Uh, for a priest, this sounds like a joke, right? Four priests met for a friendly gathering. During the conversation, one of the priests said, Our people come to us, and they pour out their hearts, and they confess certain sins. They have needs. Let's do the same. Confession's good for the soul. And so, one by one, they began to confess. One confessed they'd like to go to the movies and would sneak away after church. The second confessed to smoking cigars. The third one confessed to playing cards. When it came to the fourth one, he wouldn't confess. The others pressed him on saying, come on, man, we confessed ours. What is your secret? What is your vice? Finally, he said, it's gossiping and I can't hardly wait to get out of here. <laughs> Confession. Now I'll go to my fourth point. Speaking in prayer, in Daniel 9.21, the Bible says, Yea, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. Notice he said, while I was speaking in prayer. Well, this is a Hebrew word. It has a lot of definitions. To properly arrange... To speak, to subdue, to answer, to appoint, to bid, to command, to commune, to declare, to destroy, to give, to name, to promise, to pronounce, to rehearse, to say, to speak, to subdue, to talk, to teach, to tell, to think, to use, to utter. That's a lot of definitions for one word, isn't it? The point is this. In our prayer lives, we can use a lot of different ways to get the job done. And let us commit to that. Let us be a praying people. Let us be humble in all that we do. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, the Bible says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Do you pray about everything? I'll quit there. The rest of the lesson you can have. Maybe I'll do it again. Maybe tonight. But do you pray about everything? I am convinced that God wants you to pray about everything. When I think about the things that I've prayed for, 
It's amazing. I remember being a teenager on the bank of the creek. I threw that line out there and I would just pray, Lord, just let there be one bite. I'm not asking for much. I remember that. Isn't that funny when you look back on your memories? I remember praying over test in high school. I remember praying that I passed everything so I would graduate. There's a lot of truth in that. I have a reoccurring nightmare to this day that I'm not graduating. I remember one time I lost the best rabbit dog I ever had. The first thing I did was pray. I've prayed for my children. I pray for poor Laura all the time. But I pray for everything. The Lord wants us to. You remember when you were dating? Before you got married? You remember how much you would talk to her? Remember that? Laura brought the other day. You know, we used to talk a lot more back in the day. All of eight months ago. <laughs> Do you remember that? Getting on the phone. Maybe you were in high school. If you were like me in high school, there was one phone in the dining room, and you had to take it, and you drag this long cord as far away from everybody else as you could. You know that one that's all coiled up? It looked straight as an arrow by the time you were done. I used to sneak it into the bathroom underneath the bathroom door because there was that much room, and I'd be in there talking to my girl. And what would my parents say? Get off that phone! Somebody might be trying to call. But you remember back then when you had a goal, you wanted to win the heart of the one you loved? You remember how much you talked? I'll just leave you with this question. What's your prayer life like? If you talk that much to the one you love, the winner, how much do you talk to God? And maybe one of the reasons you don't feel as spiritual as you'd like is because you don't spend enough time communing with the Father. And so I'll just simply ask you, and I don't want you to show me, Tommy, what do your knees look like? Scott's going to sing my favorite invitation song. There's a fountain free. The invitation is for you and me. Won't you come?